Hi everyone, we are now live. Welcome to the season two premiere of the Amplify Horse Racing Hangouts. Uh, I'm so excited for those of you who've tuned in. As you can see, we have a little bit different format this season, which I'm also very excited about. And, you know, the Hangouts were so popular last season. We had over 280 people register for the Hangouts. We had, you know, over 100 people attend the various horse racing hangouts. And so I'm so excited to be able to deliver them to even more people by live streaming them over Amplify's Twitter and Facebook and YouTube. So for those of you who are new to the Hangouts, my name is Anise Montpleasure, and I'm the president and co-founder of Amplify Horse Racing. And Amplify is, I'm excited to say, now a 501c3 dedicated to promoting education and careers in the thoroughbred racing industry. So our mission is to develop a collaborative platform for youth and young adults and horse racing industry newcomers to land on and learn about the multitude of educational opportunities and learning experiences and jobs and careers that are offered in this amazing industry in, in each state. So that's one of our goals, even though we are a Kentucky-based nonprofit, you know, we really do seek to represent the industry on a national level and teach people about the opportunities nearest to them. Um, and, you know, by creating those connections and that level of enhanced engagement. So in other exciting news, for those of you who know me from being part of last season's Hangouts, um, I recently started my new job as equine education coordinator for the Kentucky Equine Education Project. So I am very, very excited to be eating, sleeping, breathing education on all of these different levels. And I'm always welcome to anyone reaching out and asking questions. If you have questions about Kentucky specific education, or more Amplify, Thoroughbred, Nationwide specific, definitely do reach out at any time. So getting back to the Hangouts, this is a platform that started to connect industry newcomers directly with Thoroughbred industry professionals. You know, it's exciting when you're first getting in, into an industry and also really important to have those networking connections, having that opportunity and ability to reach out and ask questions and connect with people who've already experienced all of this, who've already, um, you know, crossed all of these different hurdles, who've had this educational curve, and to be able to ask them about their own educational experiences. So even though this isn't like the same webinar platform that we had last season, um, I certainly hope that you guys will still send us your questions. This should be streaming live over Amplify's Facebook, YouTube, and, and Twitter. So please be commenting. Comment away. I see um, David Bridgman said, congrats, Alex. So we will be having Alex on in a little bit. And I'm also getting used to this platform. So you guys are going to have to bear with me a little bit. And then just one last thing to announce is that we recently launched the Amplify Horse Racing Podcast, which I'm super excited about. And that is um, available over Spotify and Anchor Podcasts. And I'll actually be posting the second episode tonight as soon as we get done with the podcast. Or sorry, with the, the Hangouts. So just to give you guys an intro, the theme for this year's Hangouts is back to the basics. So as we went through last year's Hangouts, there were a lot of different themes that appeared over time that really tied into the fundamentals of racing. And, um, you know, whether it was careers it, working in the racing office and how that helps a lot of people to learn and start to really embrace racing, or, you know, the fundamentals of pedigrees or just understanding the different racing jurisdictions around the U.S. So this year's hangouts are really going to be focusing on those basics while still bringing you guys a number of different professionals in the racing industry. So um, 
many there. So just to give you guys this hangout theme for tonight, you're going to see three different breeds. We're going to talk about professionals in the thoroughbred industry, professionals in the standard bred racing industry, and professionals in the quarter horse racing industry. Um, because I want to eliminate this idea that you have to just seek out learning experiences that are specific to one breed. You know, it's important to have sort of a fluid approach to it and understand that opportunities are everywhere and it's really valuable to never close any doors for yourself. So for example, I'm more thoroughbred industry based so I can speak more to the thoroughbred industry professionals, but just to name a few who started off in one industry and are now in another, and I hope our, our speakers to come will share the same things. Um, for example, Phil Antonacci, he is a graduate of the Godolphin Flying Start program, which is a two-year thoroughbred industry management course that um, I graduated from last year, as you guys might recall me talking about. And so he's actually a, a graduate of one of Ellen Taylor's programs in the standard bread industry, which you're going to hear about in a little bit. And he's now training thoroughbreds. Um, successful thoroughbred trainer Chad Brown had actually started in standard breads. And then two Hall of Fame trainers in D. Wayne Lucas and Bob Baffert were both very successful quarter horse trainers. And if I'm correct, they're both in the AQHA Hall of Fame. And we're going to hear from our, um, our AQHA group a little bit later as well. So I actually see one of our first speakers for tonight is supposed to be a jockey to be had on and he's not on yet. So we're going to give him a little bit more time. You guys get to hear me keep talking for a bit. But to give you an example of my own background getting into the industry, I grew up going to a very small track near my house that had thoroughbred racing, quarter horse racing. And then once those wrapped up, they actually had a standard bread racing meet. And so I got to experience a little bit of each from a young age. And then I actually became very interested in quarter horse racing and AQHA, as you'll hear, has some really amazing youth programs. And I ended up going through their youth racing experience scholarship competition and won that in 2013 before going on to intern for AQHA and interning for the Minnesota Quarter Horse Racing Association. So that goes to show that opportunities are everywhere. Never say no to anything. And it's important to appreciate, you know, all aspects of the industry. And to remember that at the center of this, it's the love for the horse. You know, that's often what gets all of us most excited about about any type of racing, whether it's standard breads and harness racing, whether it's quarter horses, whether it's thoroughbreds, it's really the love and appreciation for the animal itself. So we're still waiting on our jockey. So we're gonna give him a little bit more time and I would like to introduce you guys to Ellen Taylor and Alex Urbanski. I'm sorry to switch that up on you guys. I'm bringing you on. <laughs> earlier than you anticipated. But um, so Alex Urbanski is a third generation horse person from central New Jersey. So I also really appreciate that we have a, a wide view of perspectives tonight. We're all representing different states, different breeds and everything. And she's a graduate of the Harness Horse Youth Foundation summer program held at Gateway Farm in 2015. And since then, she's obtained her trainer's license and opened her stable. And in 2020, she doubled her lifetime starts with 61 and accumulated six wins, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. And she's currently in the process of obtaining her provisional driver's license and is 20 years mm -hmm. old. So I like that, you know, we're going to have um, such a wide array of perspectives. And then to introduce Ellen, she comes from a four generation racing family and both her father and mother were trainer and drivers, and she's owned and bred standard breads and has very much enjoyed her days as a caretaker and foaling attendant for the family operation. And she has for the past 30 years served as executive director of the Harness Horse Youth Foundation, a public charitable organization whose mission is to introduce and educate young people 
and their families about horse racing. And I have to say, Ellen has been a great mentor to me mm -hmm. as I've started this adventure with Amplify. So welcome both of you. And Ellen, we'll start with you. Thank you, Anise. Yeah, I know that you come from a you know family background in the industry, but what really was it that um, drew you to standard bread racing? What is it that made it really special? I think it was the family history that I was lucky enough to be growing up in. I'm sort of like a racetrack bum. This is all I know. Uh, I'm not one of those people who can look outside the box too easily. Maybe it's my age, but I was like that when I was 22. So I don't really think it's an age thing. I think it's more of a personality quirk. <laughs> but that being said, you're right about racing is racing is racing. And the horse is what is going to draw us. It's also going to what's it's going to be what keeps us together as a as a competitive sport. I agree. I agree. That's and I will second that that racing is racing. We're all here for the horse. Alex, what was it for you that, you know, sparked your initial interest in in harness racing? Um, I think it was I've been around horses my whole life. I grew up on a farm. Me, my father, and my brother, we work in the barn together every single day. I was 14 when I decided that I wanted to pursue a career as a trainer. I decided to leave high school and become homeschooled so I could be in the barn every day. And from then on, I've just, you know, been consumed by harness racing. That is a big commitment. And I, but I think that goes to show how once you kind of, are drawn into it. It's like there's such a passion for the sport that it's something that you know you have to be willing to commit your life to in, in a lot of different ways because um, caring for horses is a 365 day a year kind of job. Like you're never, you can never just shut it down. Uh, so talk a bit about, and Ellen, I'll have you do this, but uh, the origins of harness racing in the U.S., just like the Cliff Notes version of how it got started, um, maybe mention Dan Patch, and then <laughs> bring us to where we are today. The Cliff Note version is, my horse is better than your horse, and as the country developed and moved west, it was not conducive to ride a horse, but they a lot of wagons and, and pulled vehicles were bridging towards the west, and that's really the way harness racing started was my horse is faster than your horse under a hitched with a hitched vehicle. <laughs> um, that being said, there were several breeds that brought the standard bread to where it is today. We are an American breed brought to you by Morgan's Arabians and thoroughbreds, which was imported from Mes Hamiltonian is descended from messenger who was imported from England. And we fully recognize that we are a, um, a mixed pot, if you will. But the way it created a standard bred breed name is we had to meet a standard of time, two minutes and 30 seconds for a distance of a mile. And that's the reason a standard bread is called a standard bread. I did not know that. And I think that ties in really well because later we'll talk about why a quarter horse is called a quarter horse. Right. But it's right. amazing that that those names really derived from the, the horse's history as a racehorse. But please understand that now the registry is a closed registry, meaning you can't just trot a mile or pace a mile in two minutes and 30 seconds and be allowed in. It, there is a, a more stringent process now. But that was... That was the way harness racing began, and it began uh, in the East Coast. It, but it's really, once you get past Illinois and Wisconsin and Minnesota, then there's a big jump back to California. There's not a whole lot of harness racing in existence from, from the real true West. And I find that kind of interesting, especially how we got started. I'm not sure. I have to, my research is continuing on that subject. I feel like that's that's with every industry. It's like it's constantly ongoing. I'm always learn something, learning something new about the history of of thoroughbred racing all the time, and um, it's like a never ending, a never ending journey with any of this. But Alex, so as a trainer, you'll be a good one to 
to explain all of this. So talk about the equipment that people would see in standard bread racing and also the, the racing gates. How does the standard bread have different gates than you know a thoroughbred? And then be. I will bring up your video. Okay, okay. Just so don't forget, don't forget the video. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> so the gates that we use for standard breads are trotters and pacers. Um, the trot is a natural gate and the pace is more of a genetically dominant gait. Um, some equipment that you would see uh, for the standard breads would be hobbles, pacing hobbles and trotting hobbles. Overall, the harness is completely different from you know, any other type of racing. You know, when it comes to um, you know, race bikes and jog carts, they're attached and a driver sits behind uh, the horse instead of sitting on top. And a great thing to use for that would be ride reins and uh, run. So we don't ride, we drive. We don't run, I'm sorry, was I wrong? You're good. We don't run, we pace or trot. And the reins, we don't use reins, we use driving lines. So when you said that you got your, your bio mentioned about getting your driver's license and people are like, what? She's 20. Doesn't she know how to drive yet? We're talking about a different kind of driving here. Yes. Um, so with the, that, say that, I'm the one, you won't see me, but I'm the one, you know, sitting behind the horse. So I'm going to play this video here. Today we will be learning about the different gates in harness racing. Standard bred horses are bred to race at a trot or pace. The trot is a two-beat gait in which the front right and back left legs move together and the front left and back right move together, similar to how humans swing their arms opposite of their legs when they walk or run. The pace is a two-beat gait in which both right legs move together and both left legs move together. It looks like this. Notice how the horse shifts its weight from side to side as it paces. Pacers are faster than trotters and often wear a piece of equipment called hobbles to keep them on the proper gait. Sometimes a standard bread will break stride into a canter or gallop. This is often just called running and can disqualify a horse from a race if they do not quickly switch back to a trot or pace. Now test your knowledge by naming the gait of the horses in the following videos. Pause and rewind as necessary. The answers will be revealed at the end of the video. Trot. <laughs> Pace. Free I'm, I'm spoiling it for everybody. <laughs> Yay. That's amazing. Thank you guys so much for We for have sharing. to thank Alex for that because she uh, was the driver in the behind the scenes to create that video. And uh, we also had another HHYF graduate, Katie Ike, who did the photography. So I'm very proud of that video because it's short and too sweet to the point. It's I perfect. actually was able to get all those, you know, the trot, the pace and the gallop within three laps. And I <laughs> didn't even really know how to ask her to do a gallop because that's not normal, you know, for our horses. Right. For her to be able to just do it on her own, I was really happy about it. So you have to tell me, were you using a, a GoPro or were you holding your phone? Were you my videoing Katie, and driving? No, my friend Katie actually sat on the side of my jog cart <laughs> and she like put the apron down and was able to get all those angles from her iPhone. Wow, that is so cool. And explain what the apron is. So the apron is, it's a shield that's attached to the jog cart so that when they're trotting or pacing or, you know, so that the dirt doesn't get thrown right into your face. Gotcha, okay. And so one of the things I wanted you guys to talk about is, you know, we've, we've heard how different um, standard bread racing or harness racing is from other sports. You know, you're driving the horse, you're not riding like a jockey in 
thoroughbred racing or quarter horse racing. But where have you guys seen a lot of crossover between, you know, professionals who've gained experience in other industries and then come to standard bread racing or, or vice versa? Alex, you want me to go? Yeah, you can go first and then I'm sure I'm going to have some input. <laughs> I will tell you that the competitiveness, competitiveness of the jockey and or driver and the athleticism of those individuals is a strong similarity. You've got to have a mindset. You've got to have a lot of courage and you've got to have, be able to make split second decisions. And I think that goes for anybody that even a trainer to some degree, but mostly those jocks and, and drivers. Uh, that's the similarity. The difference is I think there is a perception that driving is not um, as hard maybe. I, I just, because most people ride even pleasure horses. I think that it, that's a misconception because you've got a vehicle that's about six feet wide and you're going 30 miles an hour. So not only do you have to control the horse, but you have to make sure that that race bike is safe as well. And with everybody around you, that's a difference. I'm not sure that's what you were asking, but that's my. But that's that's even better than the answer that I was I was thinking, because I didn't even consider the type of you know, spatial awareness you have to have if you're in a sulky or is it, sorry, correct me again, is it a race bike or sulky? They're interchangeable. Interchangeable. Yes. Perfect. That is good to know. Okay. But to think about, you know, as you're sitting in this, that you have to be very aware of, of your wheels and how that, you know, how to navigate among all of those other race and bikes. I know that sounds path. silly, but peripheral vision is extremely important because you're focusing on your horse and going forward. But at the same time, you have to be very, very conscious of where that horse's legs are that's sitting to the outside of you. And if you have a horse on the inside of you and then so there's you're juggling. You're really you're driving one, but you're controlling three at the minimum. <laughs> if, I think another, you know, point that you could bring up for how they're similar is just simply the respect that we all mutually have for the animal. You know, I know for sure that my horses are all, you know, a huge part of our family. And, you know, when something happens to them, you know, you cry just as much as you would over, you know, somebody in your family, you know, a, a human. So, I mean, I think that that's, you know, equally among all, you know, types of racing and, you know, people who have horses in general. Absolutely. Yeah, there definitely is. We all share that same bond, that same commonality and in, in how we came to the sport and the respect for the horse is, you know, paramount. It's absolutely essential in any type of racing. And um, it's something that I really hope that people understand. So I have two, two last questions for you guys. First, what is the most famous standard bread race out there? For both trotters and pacers, hmm. I would say the Hamiltonian would be the most famous that I know of for trotters, and the Meadowlands Pace would be the most famous pace that I know of. There you go. So yeah. everyone who's listening right now, go out there and Google the Hamiltonian and the Meadowlands Pace, and that All will right. be your. I just have to interject the Little Brown Jug because I'm from the Midwest. For I think of that one. <laughs> I've heard of the Little Brown Jug as well. <laughs> That's very cool. So everybody has their homework for tonight. I feel like that would be a good follow up to this video. I'll be posting race replays afterwards of all these oh, different how races. exciting. Yes. <laughs> and then just to wrap up, give us an overview of learning opportunities uh, through the Harness Horse Youth Foundation for young people to get involved. The Harness Horse Youth Foundation is for basically ages 12 and up. Although we, as Alex can attest, I never let my kids go. They are always a part of my life. Um, <laughs> and, and Miss Ellen is always watching over their shoulders in a good way. But we offer introductory and advanced level camps. Used to be sleepovers and really fun until COVID. And we'll see how that comes back. But Alex, what's your most vivid memory of Harness Horse Youth Foundation? My most vivid memory was being picked by you to go to Hamiltonian Day and driving the exhibition race up there. 
because we have always had an exhibition prior to the Hamiltonian with the best wow. drivers. And it was, that was Alex's highlight, which makes me very happy because um, to be exposed at that level of the industry, which is about as high as it gets in the United States, for a kid that's 13, 14 years old, it stays with them for life. I'd like that, to say, even though I didn't make the gate with my horse and I finished last by a lot, <laughs> a good time. <laughs> and that's, it's experiences like that, you know, whether it's your first time going to the track or you actually get to drive a horse in a race or, you know, you get to meet, you know, I think of the first famous jockey that I ever got to meet. Yes. It's those experiences that really, you know, clinch your love and passion for the sport. And I think that's another common bond that we all share between all three breeds is creating those experiences for people and the value and the importance of that. So with that, you know, thank you both so you, much thank you for so being much. on. I want to remind everyone who's watching as well, please send your questions over, you know, comment on this video. Um, keep posting questions, use hashtag horse racing hangout, and we will get those answered for you, even if I end up emailing the questions to our speakers afterwards. So definitely please do send us your questions. So and I just wanted to wish you the best of luck with Amplify and do a short www.hhyf.org plug for in case somebody was looking for standard bread information. Perfect. Gosh, thank you guys so, so thank much. You. And with that, now <laughs> I uh, we we confuse time zones a little bit here, you know, because I'm in Eastern time and I totally forgot that poor Relu Gutierrez is on Central time. So that was totally my bad. So I am going to welcome our jockey that we have for the night, representing our uh, thoroughbred component of this talk, and so. I feel like a lot of those who've already tuned in on the Amplify Hangouts or who are more aware of them maybe have a little bit stronger knowledge and recognition of the history of thoroughbred racing and shameless plug. We're going to talk about that more in depth on the next upcoming episode of the Amplify Horse Racing podcast. So I thought for the purposes of this video, it would be really interesting to bring on one of the most uh, visual careers in the thoroughbred industry. I think when a lot of people are thinking, oh, you know, jobs in horse racing, you know, well, I can be a jockey or a trainer. And there's actually a multitude of other things as well. But what better individual to actually talk about the passion for the sport and, um, you know, the spirit of thoroughbred racing and the connection with the animal than a jockey. So with that, I would like to welcome Relu Gutierrez. Relu, thank hey, you so on, much everybody. for Thanks joining for us me. tonight. And so Relu is a native of Rochester, New York, and he earned his first career victory at Finger Lakes in 2017. And earlier that year, Raylu graduated from SUNY Cortland with a degree in exercise science, which we're going to talk about. And then in 2018, his first full year as a rider, he was named an, an Eclipse Award finalist for Outstanding Apprentice. So for those of you who aren't familiar, the Eclipse Awards are kind of like the Oscars of thoroughbred racing. And so during 2019, Raylu continued building accomplishments on the more competitive Naira or New York Racing Association circuit and also at Gulfstream Park in Florida. He won his first graded stakes, which is like the highest echelon of racing in the thoroughbred industry. Um, in March of 2019, aboard DuShare in the grade three Tom Fool handicap at Aqueduct. And his father, Luis, trained horses at Finger Lakes. His uncle, Jose, was a longtime jockey at the track. And uh, Ray Lou is currently riding at Sam Houston Race Park in Texas on Central Time. <laughs> Where they and they actually run quarter horses and thoroughbreds at at Sam Houston, which is a good tie-in for our theme tonight. So, Raylu, thank you so much for being on. I'm sorry for the confusion, but I'm glad that you could join us. But just you know, diving in initially, I know that again you also had a background through your family in the industry. But what was it that drew you to thoroughbred racing? 
<clears throat> well, first of all, thank you for having me. And uh, what drove me to be part of this game is just my love for the animal. I mean, horses, uh, they gave me everything in my life. They continue to give me everything in my life. And um, I've always been around horses. I mean, since I was just like a chubby little kid, you know, I had no idea, like no want to be a jockey. I, everyone thought like, hey, like, you know, you're going to be too big. You know, I was, I was chubby. You know, my, my, my father's pretty muscular. So my uncle, he's always been a heavier rider. So, you know, no one in my family thought I was going to be a rider, probably outgrow it. And, uh, you know, when I, when I was in like seventh grade, I had like a big growth spurt, big growth spurt as in like from like four, six to like five, one. And I was like, ah, oh, I'm going to be like, you know, a college basketball player or something. But <laughs> I haven't grown since seventh grade. So, but, um, the horses have given me everything in life and, uh, I just love them, you know, just like being a hot walker in a group with my own father and, uh, learning from him, being in the stable atmosphere, you know, with my uncles and uh, the grooms and just hanging out with everybody. I love that. And, uh, you know, when I was in university, um, you know, as all students know nowadays, I mean, you can go to a public, private, any school, but man, when you graduate, you know, you're, you're probably in a lot of debt. And uh, you, some, some of us don't have, can deal with it pretty easy. Some of us get kind of anxious about it and want to do something about it and work. And uh, <clears throat> I was studying abroad in uh, Fulda, Germany. And just, you know, for giggles. And I was just hanging out with my, with my friend, Dandy Domenico. And uh, we were just talking. And uh, I just, you know, we were opening up, whatever. And I looked at my student loans. And I was like, wow, like, I should probably do something about this when I get back to the States. And um, I was going to go on to, to PT school. And um, I started riding a little bit, you know, I, I really dedicated myself to it just to, just, you know, just to end the, the Finger Lakes season. It was only like two months and it was at the end of 2018, I believe, or something. And um, I don't know, like I, I won for my father and I did all right. And then uh, a couple of gentlemen from <clears throat> Gulfstream Park saw me that knew my uncle, you know, so I, through him, he contacted me and was like, you want to go to Miami? And uh, yeah, I haven't looked back since. That is awesome. And that's something you touched on, you know, your educational background, which I know I mentioned in in your bio. And America's Best Racing actually did this awesome series with you last summer while you were riding in Saratoga um, called Revolution. And I really want to encourage everyone to to watch it, to look up the series. But I do want to show this particular clip right now. So I've been getting a lot of questions about you know, my education and what that whole vibe was about, you know, why I went to school if I was you know, a jockey. The answer to that question is just my family and um, our principals. And, uh, you know, my family always wanted me to get an education to have uh, a backup plan and, and, and to be able to go to school. Going to school was a priority for me as well. I mean, uh, you know, when I was younger, I never really wanted to be a rider. I always wanted to... Uh, to be a physical therapist. I got injured uh, my junior year playing in a lacrosse tournament and that kind of just sealed the deal for me. And I'm working with my physical therapist and uh, doing the rehab. And right there, I decided that's what I wanted to do. And um, I went to SUNY Cortland and that was that was a journey in itself. Um, it was a great four years or three and a half years. I graduated semester early. I was the president of Delta Chi Fraternity, which is an experience in itself. I got to travel quite a bit, you know, see some pretty cool things. I studied abroad in Europe, Fulda, Germany, London, Berlin, Barcelona, Marseille, Amsterdam. Um, so it was just a great experience. It's always good to have a backup plan, especially in a career that's so uncertain. You can be doing well one year and terrible the next year. You can get hurt and not really have a backup plan or a backup income, you know. And uh, that's something that's helped me so much is to ride stress-free because um, in a couple of years, if uh, this isn't, you know, working out hey you know i can i have a backup plan so i don't I, i've never even with my bug i never wrote with that stress in my hand with in my head I, my family is a uh, is very into academics my sister is uh studied to be a physician assistant my cousin susie is a resident at star memorial hospital uh sister-in-law camille is a gynecologist in buffalo my cousin xavier is a computer engineer just like our, our whole second generation or my you know from my family that was born here in the united states has done so much with the opportunity our parents have given us to be somebody here in this country and, and that's what's so important to to me is um you know not letting my, my parents hard work go in vain so i hope this answers kind of some of your guys's questions and uh i'm so glad you guys are interested and uh more to come thanks so again to our viewers those videos are, are really cool and they're very informative and insightful about uh, the life and career of a jockey 
But especially when it comes to education, you know, Alex Urbanski, our, our um, standard bread trainer who was on earlier, talked about how she made the decision to be homeschooled so that she could dive more into, um, you know, her career in, in the standard bread world. But just talk about, you know, the importance of, of having uh, a backup plan, but then also how that's actually benefited you in some ways as a jockey? Like, have you felt like your degree in exercise science um, has helped with your, excuse me, your career as a jockey at all? Or just explain <laughs> some of the, some of the um, shared skills there. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things like on the track and off the track, especially uh, that going to a university here in the States has helped me, particularly in my, with my degree. I mean, it's not, not it hasn't helped me at all in terms of riding a horse. I mean, there's guys who don't go to high school who are amazing jockeys. So it does not help you at all in terms of on the horse. That's just like an honest answer. But as far as taking care of my weight and being as strong as I can, but as light as I can at the same time, it has helped me. I, I like, I know how to feed my body. I know when to cheat. I know when I got to just cut, but cut the right way. So I'm not weak. We hear about it all the time when apprentice riders, you know, who have a weight allowance of five, seven, and 10 pounds, you hear them pass out or they just ride weak because they want to make that weight. And it's so important to know your limit. I'm about 114, 15 pounds on average now, which is pretty light for a rider. I mean, I, I, I always go jogging, get down to like 113, maybe 114, depending on how lazy I'm feeling. And it was just like, uh, that's like pretty light to be honest. And, um, when I was a bug boy, I was 108 pounds, 107 pounds, or a, a bug boy is an apprentice rider. And, um, but I was still s strong, you know, I, I did it the right way. You know, now, of course, you know, I have a little pizza here and there, whatever, but to an extent where I know what I'm able to hold and I know what I'm able to not withhold. And, you know, part of it, you know, it's not your, you know, your fault. I should have just realized around the Eastern time zone is that I was just the gym, you know, and uh, I always do cardio for an hour. And then I'll do like calisthenics or I'll do some weights or whatever for half an hour. And that's my routine. I'm not, that's not every rider's routine. Some riders, 45 minutes. Some riders don't do much at all. They just work in the mornings. Me, I, I just, I feel my best when I'm, my performance is at its peak. When I'm, I'm physically fit, I'm active and I'm out there. And that's just, it's not even for losing weight. It's just, you know, being getting to another level in terms of my own personal strength and uh, fitness. And uh, that's where my degree is, is coming handy big time on, on the field and, you know, performing out there and just, just off the field. I mean, going to college, I mean, when you're 18, I mean, some, some guys start riding at 16 and you can make a check for $7,000, $8,000 a week. And I mean, you can, I, you know, I can imagine at 16, if we get 8,000, 9,000, you're like, <laughs> What are you gonna do with that? Yeah. You know? Especially like <laughs> yeah. they come from another country or whatever, they don't have their parents guiding them, and it's just like if I was sixteen with nine thousand dollars, I mean, oh my, I don't even know what I would spend it on. So, you know, going to college, I mean, obviously not every jockey's gonna do that, and you know, not, you know, it's it's very unrealistic for these guys who are coming from another country. But I mean, if I could advise anybody, I absolutely would because, like every college student in America. You go to college, you grow up, you're away from your parents, you have a good time, but you learn. After you learn how to handle things, how to just act, your accounting class, your economic, econ classes, you know, you just mm -hmm. learn how to deal with money. You right, learn right. about this thing called taxes and you have to pay them yeah. or else it's very Real bad. world. <laughs> you know, so it's like you see things, you do things and you experience things. And it's just like, well, we start riding, it's like, I, you know, you're just, it's just out of your system, you know, like I, yeah. I, if I'm up past 10 PM now, I'm just like, I'm dead. So I'm just like, you know, it's just, it, it's a good thing in every, every way. Right. Right. And I think, you know, it's a great thing to touch on and that's sort of our theme tonight is about being well-rounded in so many different ways, whether it's opening your eyes to new experiences. And I think a lot of that comes back to education where if you want to have a career in the thoroughbred industry, you know, I'll have a lot of people ask me, um, well, how do I be a trainer? Well, how do I be a jockey? And there's not just one straightforward path to, okay, you hit this milestone, this milestone, and this milestone and go through this program. You know, it's really like a, um, 
make your own path and you have to figure out what's best for you. And for some people that is going to college for other people, that's, you know, becoming a, an industry apprentice for other people that might be, you know, not continuing past high school, maybe seeking out internships. So all of these different ways, but ultimately, you know, it's still important to, to seek out good mentors to take care of yourself and to take care of those fundamental things like, like money management, like you said, for a young person, that's big. Um, having a strong understanding of communications, of, you know, being, you still have to be a people person, even if you love horses and you're more of an animal person. But I'm curious to know, what what has been your most valuable horse racing industry learning experience? You know, whether it was a job, whether it was a lesson somebody taught you, what is something that other young people who might be interested in being like you should know? Wow. There's some, you learn something every, every day in horse racing. It's, it's kind of crazy. Like I can't really touch on one. It's just, you, you just gotta have an open mind. Uh, in particular, I, I, like I grew up at Finger Lakes racetrack. It's a small track in Western New York and, um, it doesn't have the clout of Naira tracks, Saratoga, Belmont. It doesn't have that. You're, at a humble, hardworking, blue-collar track. And uh, what I can take from that is you, you've got to work hard. Nothing is given to you. Nobody cares who you are, who your parent is, what your last name is. It doesn't matter. You have to work hard, and you, you got to go for you. Whether you want to be a jockey, an assistant, a trainer, you got to do your thing. And people notice everything on the racetrack. You know, if you were, you know, whether you – are saying the right thing to somebody be honest like don't just say something to just uh, uh, please them people want to hear honesty because no one on the track i'll tell you right now has time for the bs you know people are there to work hard and and, and be with their horses and just be honest you know whether it's what they want to hear what they don't hear be honest be genuine be polite be humble be respectful you know and, and seriously just just go about your business and, and just do the best you can, but you have to work hard. You have to be open-minded because you don't know, nobody knows anything. You can, you know, like I was an Eclipse Award finalist as, as an apprentice rider. And honestly, I really didn't even start learning how to ride until the next year. And, you know, you get that, you know, that little bit of fame, Eclipse Award, whatever, but it didn't mean anything. You know, it's just, you, when you lose the bug, you start at zero and uh, you have to, you have to just be open, man. Like, you know, it doesn't matter. And like, you know, progressively take it day by day and just learn a little bit every day and go to the big leagues go you know I, I rode in the best colony in the united states for the past two years and i learned from the best of the best johnny v irad jose manny you know and it was like the guys who weren't even in the top 10 and they're they're still amazing riders like the, some guys you don't hear about people talk about oh my god that this they're so amazing. Like, you know, Eric Cancel, Junior Alvarado, these guys that, you know, don't have the leading rider credentials. I mean, they're still really, really good riders. And they're like 10th to 9th in the standings. Jose Lascano, guy who's the leading rider in Naira right now, Kendrick Carmouche. Uh, a couple years ago, I finished ahead of him in the standings. Now he's dominating it, the Naira circuit. And it's just like these guys, all of them in New York, have titles everywhere. And then they come to New York, and it's like the best of the best. Any horse can win any day. The guy we see right now, Georgie Vargas, he's lighting him up. He's been a leading rider. He's such a good rider. And it's just like, you see that chance. And, you know, and uh, you just have to be open all the time. And no matter what you want to be, just push yourself, get to the big leagues. And after you go to the big leagues, if you want to come back down to a smaller track, cool. And, you know, I mean, like, that's all, that's all good. But push yourself to be with the best of the best and just learn from them. And so to sum it up, you know, what – what is it to you that uh, makes the thoroughbred so special? You know, when you're when you're riding in a race and you're sitting on that horse, like what is it that kind of speaks to you the most of of that experience? Sure. Oh man, there's nothing like when they give you that last lead change, turning for home, and you know you got something under you, and they just kind of explode. There's nothing. There's no better feeling like that. There's there's no better feeling than, than just sitting behind someone and being like, man, when we turn for home, I got you. And um, it's an adrenaline rush. It's a high. It's a uh, it's something you can't explain. Um, I wish everybody could just feel that, you know, for a bit, you know, and that 
last 16, uh, when you're running someone down, I mean, you're just like, you want to get there. And uh, it's amazing how the emotions just run. And, you know, thoroughbred racing is just, it's, it's a great sport. It's an amazing sport. And, yeah. Uh, there's so many emotions, you know, one second you're up here, the next second you're, you know, you, you're down here, you, you got to just stay right here because even if you win, don't get too high, you know, but I, there's nothing just like, like running someone down and just, you know, getting nipping them at the wire, you know, it's, it's a really, really great feeling. And I think even people who are just watching it, you know, could pick up on that. Like I've never, I used to exercise ride a little bit. Um, and I think I've, I've worked two horses in my life. Um, yeah. But just as a fan, you know, I was captured by watching that because you right. still pick up on these animals have been bred for this. They have that drive and that competitive spirit, you know, for, for hundreds of years that has been bred into them. And so for you to actually be able to feel and experience that firsthand, that's, that's super cool. But Raylu, thank you so, so much for coming on tonight. Really, it. really appreciate it. Um, you know, everyone, if you have any other questions for Raylu, please send them our way, comment or send me an email. I'll make sure that they, they get to him somehow. So again, thank you so much. Good luck at, at Sam right. Houston and hope to see you again soon. Awesome. Take care guys. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Wow. What a night guys. This is, this is really, really cool. And uh, again, I'll post those videos that I mentioned, but thank you so much to Raylu for coming on. I think that, again, that's a jockey is one of the most visual professionals in the sport, kind of the first uh, focal point that you see. And so to actually hear his perspective and also that, that educational background and, and information is really valuable for young people. And so also, you know, finally wrapping up and getting to our quarter horse group, I should say last but not least, because the American Quarter Horse Association has been huge to my own career and my own learning experience. So I'd like to welcome Janet Van Beber and Claire Lee. Thank you both so much for being with us. And I think we, we might be getting a little bit of feedback here. Claire, if you have headphones, it might work a little bit better. But I'm just going to introduce these two because we, we're very lucky to have such a qualified, amazing group of individuals tonight. I really think that reflecting on everyone's bios uh, is a really valuable learning experience in itself because you can start to see people's backgrounds and start to consider you know, how, how they built up to their own careers. So Janet is the chief racing officer for the American Quarter Horse Association. And she's responsible for planning, directing, and coordinating the racing department, racing challenge, and related programs. And she plays a key role in developing and implementing programs and objectives to promote the advancement of quarter horse racing across the globe. And her resume includes a successful career training and racing American quarter horses. So she's really had experiences on, on all aspects of it. Um, she's the former owner of Van Beber Racing Stables of Ledbetter, Tex Ledbetter, Texas, and she's had a long history of involvement with American Quarter Horses and Quarter Horse Racing, um, being well known as one of the industry's most accomplished trainers. And in 2011, she became the first trainer to eclipse the thousandth career mark, and she's the leading female trainer by Money Earned, and her resume also included being the recipient of the 2002 AQHA Mildren and Vessels Special Achievement Award, and her career includes training world champion Taylor Fitt, who remains ranked as one of the breed's top money earners 15 years after his final race, and in addition to owning Van Beber Racing Sables of Ledbetter, Texas, Janet has been on the board of directors for both the Texas Quarter Horse Association and the Texas HBPA, which is the Horseman's Benevolent and Protective Association, while also owning and managing other horse-related enterprises. And then, Claire, you and I have a couple things in common, both the, the youth racing experience and our, our one desire to be a jockey. So yes. Claire is the 2020-2021 AQHYA first vice president, and she's a native of Texas. She's been involved in the quarter horse industry since she was very young, first with halter horses, um, and soon gained the need to speed, need for speed, sorry. Claire now competes in barrel racing, 
pole bending, and now cowboy mounted shooting, which is awesome. And within the American Quarter Horse Youth Association, she's participated in the Young Horse Development Program, the AQHA Youth World Contests, and then the H AQHA Youth Racing Experience, which I'll have her talk about. But although Claire's experiences with racehorses have main, has mainly been repurposing them um, to become great speed and mounted shooting horses, um, make no mistake that she loves the, the horse racing industry and wishes she could be a jockey. Same girl, that's actually where I, I kind of started out. Um, her main experiences in learning about different aspects of the racing industry come from uh, the Texas Quarter Horse Youth Association Racing Experience and Yearling Sale and the AQHA Youth Racing Experience where she won the top scholarship. Claire is pursuing her education at Texas A&M College Station in Biomedical Science. So welcome, both of you. Thank you so, so much for being here. And as I started out with the other speakers, I'd love to hear, Janet, starting with you, what drew you to quarter horse racing? You know, I was listening to Ray Lou's comments, and I thought to myself, you know, he could fit right in with our crowd because he has that need for speed. He talked about the explosive speed at the end of the race, and, and I think that's one of the strongest features of our particular aspect of the industry, and that's what has always drawn me to the American Quarter Horse. Uh, it's, it's the speed, the uh, explosive speed, the, their desire to be in front from gate to wire, and, um, you know, the horses love their job. And uh, I've always loved being a part of helping them uh, in the role that God designed them for. That is that is really, really cool. And Claire, how about you? How did you get hooked up with doing the uh, youth racing experience? So I did the racing experience first through my affiliate, which is the Texas Court of Horse Youth Association with uh, Director Valerie Clark and Mr. Rob Wurstler. So they kind of were the first ones to kind of just take me around, uh, let me see kind of uh, right by the gates and just kind of just seeing those horses just explode right at the gates, like best seats in the house, uh, period. Uh, absolutely loved that. And so I could almost uh, relate maybe a little bit to the jockeys. Um, because I am a barrel racer and I do have uh, race horses as my speed horses and that explosive speed on the end, uh, that heart to win because they want to win just as bad as, as we do. And I greatly respect them for it. And I love to watch that sport. So it actually came first from the Texas quarter horse experience that got me into the racing industry. And I still kind of pester my dad to buy me a full-time racehorse. <laughs> and I think that, you know, going back to, to Ellen and Alex's speech earlier, you know, it really gets back to experiences. There's a huge amount of value in giving people an experience with the sport and, you know, that in-person engagement to really fall in love with it. And I want to come back to off the track quarter horses and, and what they excel in. But Janet, could you touch on the origin of the the name Quarter Horse and where that came from? Because I thought it was interesting that the standard bred name also came from that breed's history as a racehorse. But how about for Quarter Horses? How did they get that name? Well, like you, I learned something new today about the standard breeds. And our Quarter Horses, uh, it's pretty easy. We Our breed association started in 1940, and um, we named the standard horses uh, that were oftentimes working on the ranches um, and then they were brought together as competitions and they were the horses that were best at running a quarter of a mile or 440 yards hence the name the american quarter horse and they are amazing to watch and there's actually a video that i i want to share with you guys and then janet i will have you explain uh, the importance of this particular filly in, in this year. Give me one second. They're off in the Rainbow Futurity. A hypersonic start for Whistle Stop Cafe. Cyber Monday is charging up the inside. Mr. Illusion is right there with Cyber Monday on the outside. Is seven and down the center. Whistle Stop Cafe with win. Mr. Illusion, Mr. Illusion, Whistle Stop Cafe with the Whistle Stop Cafe. 
Hello again, everyone. I'm Greg Thompson of StallionEsearch.com here for the Rainbow Futurity coverage here up on the mountain at Rio oh. Downs. It's the second. There we go. Okay, so talk about Whistle Stop Cafe and because she was 2020 champion American Quarter Horse Racehorse. Am I getting that title correct? You are. We just had that ceremony last Thursday night where we announced our AQHA 2020 champions. And there are uh, divisional champions for each age and each gender. And then um, it progresses up to our world champion. And it's very unusual for a two-year-old filly to beat the boys in divisional ranks. Um, so it takes a pretty special filly. And then the thing that was really um, unique and exciting for Whistle Stop Cafe is that she clinched the overall world champion award over all other competitors, all ages and all genders. And one of the things that made her unique and, and capture that particular award is that she won the All-American Futurity at 440 yards. The clip you happened to show was the Rainbow Futurity. The filly was undefeated in her six outs in 2020, but her next uh, trials and finals that would come after that particular race was going 440. And, and that's a pretty long distance for a two-year-old filly to have to sprint the whole way. And the fact that she dominated and did so impressively is what helped her get um, the prestigious award. So can you explain in quarter horse racing uh, the prominence of, of two-year-old racing and, and why that is so important uh, in, I guess, the culture of the sport and then also the All-American Futurity? Sure. So yes, we race all breeds. And yes, we at the American Quarter Horse Association do put an emphasis on the older horses. I myself in my career, um, I, I trained five world champions and uh, three or four out of the five uh, ran until they were seven years old. So um, I'm, I'm careful to make sure that people understand that. There is a big emphasis put on the futurity program and they are very lucrative. Um, and so people start paying into races oftentimes when they're weanlings and yearlings um, and they, they and the, their purse monies accumulate from those repetitive payments and make them lucrative along with the sponsorship money and, and what have you. So um, there are futurities all over the nation and internationally. Um, we have a big international presence both in Canada, Mexico and South America. And um, oftentimes there are trials and uh, there are time trials where the top 10 or 12 horses, depending on the conditions of the race, get to come back and, and compete in the finals. And the thing that's so fascinating about it um, is that they, they determine the finalists by thousandths of a second. Wow. So uh, when you get to um, three points past the decimal to determine whether or not you are one of the the top qualifiers, um, then every single fraction of a second makes a difference. And then those horses with the fastest time get to come back and compete in the finals. And so it's a, it's a pretty wow. exciting um, business paradigm. It's, it's certainly amazing to watch. It, somebody had kind of summed up quarter horse racing to me by saying, you know, we narrow it down to the best part of the race and that's the whole race is the best part. So it's, it's amazing. And so Claire, you know, you've had some experience taking on off the track quarter horses and, you know, that's a lot of different breeds of race horses from, you know, standard breads from my understanding, excel in endurance, they excel in dressage and all sorts of different disciplines, you know, thoroughbreds off the track thoroughbreds have been used for everything from barrel racing to mounted police horses and eventing. Um, but what do you use your off the track quarter horses for? Explain that and, and how you selected your off the track quarter horse race horses to go into other disciplines. Okay, so with AQHA, we kind of like to brag that our quarter horse is the most versatile. And uh, the, actually, the race horse is actually one of the most sought out after horses because of their discipline. And so I've mainly had experience using uh, race horses for bail racing because we do need that really quick speed. Uh, we like those really nice left turns. 
uh, although we kind of have to work on the right ones a little bit, uh, but those left turns are beautiful. And then uh, now because I'm into the um, mounted shooting, uh, that also that speed, that just good mentality, uh, because when you are in those alleyways, when you are in those arenas, um, it kind of gives them the mindset of being in the gate. And so they know that, hey, it's go time. Uh, we're ready to go. And so I really like that mentality because when I'm not in the arena, they are as calm as a cucumber. Uh, you know, sometimes they might get a little excited, but, you know, that's kind of just with, with any athlete. Like, we're excited to go run. We're excited to go, um, you know, hit the baseball. Like, you know, they're kind of just really uh, athletes to me is kind of how I think about it. And so um, I really, when choosing a racehorse, um, I'm kind of just biased in the sense I really like tall horses and racehorses are very tall. <laughs> and so we kind of look uh, for some height, but I think overall, uh, a lot of them have the speed that come genetically. Um, it's about having that good mindset. And that's why uh, racehorses, have actually been uh, bred with cutting horses or with cow horses to get that faster speed when chasing after a cow. So it is a really versatile animal being a racehorse. And then also uh, really big racehorses, uh, you know, those 16 hand barrel horses, the racehorses, they uh, actually become mounted patrol horses. Uh, my family and I actually uh, got to use a lot of uh, race horses to use for the uh, United States Border Patrol. We were able to wow. train them for the Mounted Patrol. So that was really good about giving them a second life after the track. And I think that that's really important because they, all these horses still do have a great purpose. And a lot of them, you know, they want a job to do. They love doing their job. And, you know, that, that speed is, uh, is great to come by in a bind, whether it be in mm -hmm. the arena, outside of the arena, um, in, with the cow horses, that kind of thing. So I really like just the versatility of what a racehorse can bring you. Absolutely. And that brought up a good point that, you know, regardless of the breed, whether it's a quarter horse, a standard bred, a thoroughbred, you know, these racehorses do have incredible potential to come off the track and go to any number of disciplines and the discipline that each horse excels in is going to depend on its confirmation, how it's built. It's going to depend on its mind and whether they're cool as a cucumber, as you said, or whether they need something that's, you know, more stimulating, more high pace. Uh, so, but these horses are, are, you know, always placed in other industries, you know, they're, we're always going to make sure that they're well taken care of after their careers on the track and that they have another job. So Claire and Janet, thank you both so much for joining us tonight and talking about the history and the importance and the amazing versatility of the American quarter horse. Um, I'm a big fan. I have a quarter horse mare named Sam's Misty. So i to represent there. And uh, thank you both for coming on tonight. Well, it's certainly our pleasure. And, and I've enjoyed the common denominator of both of you being graduates from our youth racing experience and to see how well you are doing as horsemen out in the industry. It's an amazing program, for sure. It gives an experience of a lifetime and um, you get a great foundation, that's for sure. I second that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So thank you both. I hope to see you again soon. And with that, guys, we have wrapped up our show for the night. I'm so amazed. Season two, five amazing speakers tonight covering three different horse racing breeds. I hope that you've learned a lot because I certainly have. Just a reminder that this episode will be recorded and you'll be able to watch it again on the Amplify Horse Racing YouTube page. I'll be sure, sure to share that across our social media platforms. Again, tune into the Amplify Horse Racing podcast. We'll dive more into the actual history of the thoroughbred in our upcoming episode. And 
anytime you have any questions about education and, and equine, whether it's equine specific or horse racing specific, please reach out to info at amplifyhorseracing.org. And as always, check out, if I could get my little banner up here, just kidding, it wants to keep my name up, <laughs> amplifyhorseracing.org. Uh, I was going to put that as a great banner across the screen, but this is where my technology failed me for tonight. So anyways, Thank you all. Thank you for hanging out with our horse racing professionals tonight. And I hope to see you again soon.